do you remember, I think it was in 2011 or 12 when a dolphin got like, I think it was lost in the Gowanus Canal and everyone was like watching for like three terrible hours as it like flailed and died and like suffocated. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I think about that a lot. So, okay, so, well, good. So then we can segue segue into whales that, we can segue into whales that way. That's a good, that's a good segue. Okay. Um, Because it gets on a lot of the things that I, I'm really passionate about, which is, um, ocean health, uh, pollution, and how that affects the food web and top predators like like whales are. Um, and you're probably saying, well, it's because New York water is disgusting and gross and all this. That's probably what you're imagining. And it is, but it's not like significantly worse than say like, lo- like off the water off like Los Angeles and um, San Francisco, um, you know. Large- oh, really? Oh yeah, I mean, I, I I can't. Don't quote me on that. I know I'm literally being quoted on that. While I'm being recorded, <laughs> and will then be broadcast, right? But I can always edit it. Like if we need a no. <laughs> correction, we just drop the audio and well, put the subtitle. So <laughs> retracted. Off the record, you if, just need to. Say if I go, if record, I go swimming yeah. <laughs> there and I get some weird rashes, I'm gonna sue you. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Hello, welcome to Smooth Brain, the laid back neuroscience podcast, uh, where we fill in the void that coronavirus has made in our research communities, that of spontaneous communication. So uh, I'm Marianne Redden. I'm a cognitive and affective neuroscientist, currently a postdoc uh, in the Stanford Social Neuroscience Lab. I'm I'm Zach. Do you want to introduce me? Yeah, this is Eichner, (laughs) Dr. Eichner Benevento. Mm Mm-hmm. She is a psychologist working at Uge University in Istanbul. And, uh, That's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the mother. And she's doing a great job. Uh, and I'm Zach. I'm not a scientist. That's <laughs> it. You just like talk about what you're not. I, you know, in, in terms of this show, these are all scientists. I'm a, I'm a layman. I'm the every. I'm the stand-in for you, the viewer. That's, I, I, I was actually excited when I'd asked Marianne about um, your background because I wanted to do some homework on you because I figured, you know, it was going to be some fancy neuroscience stuff that I like would have no idea what anyone's <laughs> talking about. But, you know, she's like, no, he's the layman in quotes. And so you are the layman, but what does the layman do? You know, we want to have like a, I want to have like a general understanding. We talked about like stuff like Melville and Moby. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, he brings in the artist Moby. I make <laughs> You know, you try to make each, I connect, I'll try to connect these big uh, points to everyday life. Oh, all right, cool. Yeah, that sounds awesome. I'm down. That's a great, that's a great question. What does the man do? Yeah, you're the everyman. You're like the, yeah, what does the everyman do? Well, today I woke up, had a little plate of breakfast. I, uh, Kissed my wife goodbye and I went to work. <laughs> to the to the screen. <laughs> I walked over to the screen, and uh, you know I put in my hours. I got you know. Another, also, he another... also, yeah, you also got me a pair of shoes. Oh, I bought my wife a pair of shoes. Wow! Wow, seeing a superstar there. There you go. <laughs> so. That's what the layman do. That's what the layman does. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Yeah, we'll try our best to reach the layman. That's 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 my goal. <laughs> if you want to get laid, man, you gotta do stuff like that. <laughs> well, that is true. Be nice to women. Nice yeah, to, we try. Nice yeah, buy shoes, maybe, and other things. <laughs> and our guest today is Dr. Matthew Savoka. Do you want to say a little bit about yourself? Sure. Yeah. Um, I am a marine biologist. I work at the Hopkins Marine Station of Stanford University. And I study uh, how human impacts affect the marine world, particularly marine predators, things like whales and seabirds. Um, I tend to study pollution mostly, so like plastic pollution in the oceans and 
the impact that's having on animals and things of that nature. Um, but I really just got into the work that I do because I love animals and figuring out why and how they do all the amazing stuff they do um, and how we can keep them around to keep on doing that amazing stuff and show and teach more people about the natural world. So in those efforts, when, when Marianne asked me if I wanted to be on, on her show, I was stoked because I really, really, I would talk about this stuff for fun. Like I would have this Zoom call not being recorded uh, because it's fun for me. In fact, um, one of the great thrills of uh, recently has just been talking to Marianne about uh, neuroscience stuff and her asking me whale questions and me asking her neuroscience questions and um, yeah, it, it, it's, it's been really fun. Also, it should be mentioned that Marion and I went to high school together. So we've known each other for like 20 years almost, which is just wild. Yeah. Um, I want to say a little and, bit about how, uh, about your image in high school. Can I? Can oh, I, I would, I would, I, I would, I think that'd be very fun. And I'm curious <laughs> to hear where that goes. So please do. I feel, I'm trying to figure out when we started to be friends, but I feel like this is before we actually were friends. We were in the same bio class. So this had to be freshman year. I sat in the back, you were in the front with Jonathan Panarella and the two of you always were talking about, like you knew everything about every animal that came up. Animal the, facts, yeah. Yeah, and then everyone called um, Matt the bird man. And I used to think that they were just making it up because I was like, how, there's no way they would just like, like they would just say something they would be like, and the wingspan is, or like, and this, like whatever. Like, and I was like, there's, they're just bullshitting, <laughs> you know? But then it turned out they were like, yeah, uh, like savants. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. That's really funny because Jonathan Panarelli, this other guy I went to high school with, he thought, before he not got to know me, he thought my nickname was the Birdman because I looked like a bird. So I like this. <laughs> so I like this. I like this interpretation better. I'll go. I, I prefer this one. Um, I mean, I do have a big nose, I guess. No, I don't no, think you, you look don't. like a bird. No. <laughs> but uh, you know, <laughs> certainly not um, big enough to be called the Birdman. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um, well, among all the um see ocean creatures why did you pick whales yeah that's a really that's a really good question um i mean i think the the obvious answer that maybe you expect and is you know definitely somewhat true is like whales are awesome everyone loves whales right i mean like it's nice to work on an animal that you don't have to explain to people why it's cool or what it is <laughs> that's cool. But that's not why I, I worked on them. I actually work on them um, because we know so little about them. And that's really fun for me as a scientist um, to work on an animal that is both at the same time, super charismatic, but also super unknown. Um, those two things are really valuable um, and for a scientist. I don't mean financially valuable. And also really exciting as a scientist, mm -hmm. right? Because you can motivate people to, to, to get pumped on it. And also you can find out a lot of cool stuff that we didn't know. Um, I don't want to say easily, definitely not easily because otherwise we would have known it. But but like, it's just like, oh man, we didn't know that. Are you kidding me? For example, and this is something Marion and I have spoken about. Um, my boss who I work with now at the Marine Station, he published a paper in 2019 that, um, you know, again, all it really did, it was a very impressive feat, but was measured a blue whale's heart rate. So we put a tag on a whale and um, yeah, and, and measured, I could, I, could, I could share my screen and show you that. If, if, yeah, you guys if you're gotta interested. see this, this is so cool. Yeah, I measured a blue whale's heart rate. So um, let me see, let me find it here. Um, but, but anyway, the point that, that I'm making is that you'd figure like, oh, largest animal alive, incredibly charismatic, blah, blah, blah. Uh, we definitely know, the most basic aspects of their biology, for example, um, what 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 a what its heart rate is, and no, I mean it's never it had never been measured until a couple of years ago, and so to be able to to work on a project and and you know uh, I, I I played a small role in this project, so it's not like this is definitely not my thing, um, but I can share the work with with you and uh, here we go. Yeah. And so this, so this is just the paper that first reported uh, uh, blue, blue whale's heart rate. And so I'll just cut to the chase here. What's cool about it. 
Yeah, do you have a picture of the device? Um, it's like a I, suction cup. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I, do you want me to show that first? I could show that first, then we can talk about this. Or do you want me to just, do you want to just yeah, go maybe forth on this? ground them on like what it looks like. Like you like harpoon it onto them, right? It doesn't hurt. And then- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It makes it sound, it makes it sound very Moby Dick-like. Um, <laughs> sure. Um, so let's see here, okay. I'm gonna share a different screen. Oh, this screen. is so cool, though. I, I know we've talked about this. But I really would love to study heart rate synchrony in the whales and see if it's similar to like um, humans like syncing up when they um, interact and like working yeah. groups. Yeah. 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 So, so if you had like actual ideas, I do think we should talk about that in a serious way because yeah. I think there could be a lot of interest in that. Now, I, I think. Well, I don't think, I know that the development of this tag is still underway. So just like even getting a heart rate signal is not trivial, even now, even though like this this example worked, it's just, it's kind of like, oh, this worked, but like, how do we get it to work consistently and well to the point yeah. where we could do these types of experiments? However, when we get to that point, my, my boss currently has a grant to do that exact thing, to basically yeah. get these tags to the point where like they can, um, uh, I'm gonna stop this share, I'm gonna start a different share. Um, to get these tags where they can consistently and well um, uh, monitor things like heart rate, then, and pretty soon thereafter, we can get at really, really cool questions about um, like these, these things, yeah, because whales have all kinds of cool behavior, cool social interactions, cool foraging behavior, all kinds of wild stuff that I'll talk briefly about. Do they um, have facial expressions? I mean, it looks like these belugas do, but like... I would, I would be, I would be surprised if they don't. Um, yeah. One of the things that I, I, I will say, and it's really hard to not do that thing that you're not supposed to do. So I need to go inside. Like and, anthropomorphize. Yeah, yeah, them. Yeah, 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 yeah. I was I just gonna. All the time. <laughs> yeah, I was just gonna say. Um, I'm just gonna go inside because my computer battery is dying. Um, so, yeah, it's it's hard to not anthropomorphize, but I will say that the times that I've been face to face with whales, um, which has been a handful of times with a handful of species, um, they do seem genuinely curious. And this is this was never better contrasted for me than when I was, this was just a vacation actually, but then when I was in um, uh, Baja, California, and we, dove with whale sharks, um, which is actually really easy to do in Baja if you ever want to do it. It's pretty cool. And whale sharks are giant fish, right? They're the biggest fish in the world. And kind of like They're a not fish, mammals? Oh, sorry. No, whale shark is a shark. Okay. Um, sorry. Yeah, yeah. It's, it is the biggest uh, fish ever. Well, I don't know about ever. It's the biggest fish currently in, in the sea. Okay. Um, uh, and Anyway, but they, they, they filter feed on plankton, they're giants, so that's why they got the name whale shark. They do a lot of things like a whale, but they are a fish, a shark. But anyway, when you're in the water with whale sharks, they're just kind of, they kind of don't notice you. They're kind of not inquisitive. Again, I'm, I, don't, I don't know how I feel about using these, these words. They mm-hmm. don't seem curious. They don't seem playful. They're just kind of like a fish, like on you know, autopilot sort of thing. And, and very, very similar, honestly, to a fish that you would have in your tank at home, you know, mm-hmm. like they might come and see if you're like, oh, the person's coming over with food now, but fish aren't like going to play with you. They're not going to interact with you typically. Mm-hmm. I was saying no fish would do that, but like, mm-hmm. but then a couple of days later, we went to see gray whales in their, in their nursing grounds where they had their little babies and they come right up to you. They're looking at you. They're interacting with the boat. They like to get water splashed on them. They like mm-hmm. put their, they put oh. their different body parts out to get pet. They like to get pets and scratches. Like they like to get scratches. They do. I bet they do have sea tactile afferents. I bet they do. Uh, like the the, um, the neurons that sense gentle touch. Oh yeah, I'm sure they do. Yeah, they, they must, right? I mean, they they have to they have to nurse. They have yeah, to right nursing have- and they thought it was evolved for grooming behavior, so it's thought to be only in hearing mammals. Nurse? What's what was that? that? Whales nurse, Whales yeah. Nurse? Oh. oh yeah, yeah. There's yeah. actually oh man, see this is there's too much stuff to talk about. So these tags. Which I which I'll just show you like a little picture of here, a uh, little illustration. Um, but <clears throat> they get attached by suction cup. Can you see this? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They get attached by suction cup. Uh, but I like to call them a whale iPhone because they basically have all the different sensors that your iPhone has. 
um, and therefore can do a lot of the same stuff that your iPhone can do. Uh, so they have, a, they have a camera, they have a GPS, they have a light sensor, um, they have uh, accelerometers and magnetometers. Accelerometers, for example, when you like turn your phone and then the screen knows to shift its orientation, yeah. uh, that's exactly, that's an accelerometer in your phone doing that. Uh, and these tags have that as well. Um, accelerometers also, and importantly in your phone and in these tags, can figure out how many steps you took or how far you went or things of that nature. And so the accelerometers in these tags are really important because it can tell us about the behaviors of these animals when we can't see them, which is almost all the time, by the way. So, you know, when we see whales, we being just humans, they're like up at the surface taking a breath and then they're gone. So they live almost their entire lives outside of anything we can view. Um, and so these, not the, it, the bio, this is called biologging to attach a device like this onto an or onto a wild animal to see what it's doing is called a biologger. So these biologging tags of which our lab uses them, but many other labs use them for a huge, huge variety of animals um, have been revolutionary, truly, truly revolutionary in figuring out what animals are doing when we're not watching them. And if you want to talk about neuroscience and psychology and behavior, uh, it's been shown again and again that animals do different stuff when we are and aren't watching them. I mean, that's probably not surprising, Absolutely. but you know, in any case, this is really great that we can have this technology now because now we can really see what they're doing when they don't know uh, that we're watching them. So our see, baby does stuff when we're not watching him. <laughs> Bad yeah, so, stuff. Yeah. So, so here's here's a picture of um, someone in our lab um, putting a tag on a blue whale off the coast of Big Sur, California. This is kind of near Monterey. <clears throat> um, and basically, the the whale surfaces to breathe. It's a handy thing that they do for us because they have to come to the surface. They breathe air. Um, and when they do that, you can just kind of cruise up next to them and with a burst of speed, get alongside of them and slap a tag on the back. It's tags are attached by suction cups. Uh, it's basically, I want to say minimally invasive, but it's like hardly invasive at all. I mean, we don't even know if they feel this. Um, they have no real apparent reaction. And then the tag stays on for about 10 hours, give or take. And during that time, it's collecting hundreds of data points a second. Um, and when you reconstruct those data points, you get data that looks sort of like this. So this is a blue whale uh, from 2011. So when these tags are put on the whales, we can later, we have to retrieve them, which is always fun. Um, but when we retrieve them, we get incredible records of what these whales are doing down to the millisecond. Um, and it's fascinating. So what you're seeing here is a tag that was put on a blue whale in California in 2011. So I actually wasn't involved with this field work. This was um, <clears throat> before I got to Monterey. But in any case, um, on the Y axis here, that's the depth. So you can think of zero. This is like the surface of the water here. Um, and on the X axis is just time. And we're looking at a tag that was on a blue whale from about four o'clock in the afternoon until about midnight uh, or a little before midnight, I guess. Was that uh, 10, something like that. So what you're seeing here is this is, a, this is a typical activity pattern of a blue whale, the largest animal to ever live off the coast of California. And when they're in California, they're feeding um, an incredible, an incredible, incredible amount. And that's, this is to actually quantify that as the big project I'm working on now. But in any case, uh, what these little wiggles are at the surface, this is them uh, breathing up here. These are these breathing periods. And then after they take a handful of breaths, they dive down to somewhere between typically between 100 and 300 meters. And this, in this example, it starts at about 200 meters and each red dot represents a mouthful. Uh, so these whales rush forward, take a huge gulp of krill. So it's like little shrimp animals in the water. And after they do that <clears throat> a couple of times, they need to come back up and get air. Because basically what these animals are doing is they're, they're taking a deep breath, diving down, and then imagine like sprinting underwater um, and I'll show you, I can actually show you videos of this behavior. Um, that's probably what you came here for, see cool whale videos. So I got some of those too. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, but this is an incredibly demanding aerobic activity, <clears throat> uh, this, this lunge feeding behavior, which I'll show you in a minute. Are so they doing this in groups or solitary? Great question. So for 
a long time, we thought blue whales were, you know, either solitary or, um, you know, like, like we didn't think their social dynamics were super important for blue whales. But one of the things that these tags are revealing is actually there, it's really important. I'm actually going to cut away just to show you. Um, uh, hold on. Hold this. Oh, I met that guy. That's your friend. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah, Max. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's great. Um, okay. So this is a tag on the back of a blue whale. I'll just take a little segue um, because it'll answer a lot of Marianne's questions. And then we can cool. go back to that other data. Um, so the video here, that's the video from the tag. And then there's this other data. This is the sciencey parts down here. Um, and uh, there's a, a grad student in the lab who uh, really did his whole, almost his whole PhD was to, to make this shit work. It's is he so getting pitch roll yaw from the camera? From the tag, from the from, from the, the, the tag from the acceler okay. from the accelerometer, right? Cool. So that's that's why it's useful to have these accelerometers because you, you don't always have video, even though the tags have cameras. Uh -huh. they don't, sometimes, if you if the water's too murky or if the whales go too deep, which is common, uh -huh. uh, you can't you can't see anything. Um, mm -hmm. So you need to be able to tell from the data record what the animal is doing, even if you can't see anything. So that's why the data is really important. Cool. And you can, val you can validate, we do validate with video to confirm that if the data looks like this, we know the whale is doing that, that sort of thing. Do you think um, we could put an EEG on one of these things? I don't so, even know if you could put that underwater. Like there's gotta like, be a way. So, so, that's, so, so that's, what, that's what I'd really like to talk with you or like an, you and an engineer about because yeah. I think that could be really cool. Yeah. And the issue is, does it have to be like right on top of the brain? We have, yeah. Yeah, you wouldn't be, even know where the signal's coming from. And it can also pick up, yeah. you know, muscle. So, so yeah. yeah, so I think that might be yeah. the issue, right? But uh, in any case, yeah, I think that'd be really cool. And there's yeah. nothing known about brain. There, there's just nothing known about brain activity in a living large whale. If no, anything's known but, about- Sorry, but, but from brain uh, development, because there was a, a researcher when I was at Mount Sinai who studied like comparative neurology um, and he was one of the guys who found va von Economo neurons. Are you familiar with these? No. It's probably. They're like, they're one of my favorites. It's one of the things that got me hyped on neuroscience early on, you know, but there are these like special cells they are called spindle cells. They're only found in um, the brains of mammals, select mammals that are highly social pretty much is like the, you know, the punchline, but it's in humans. It's in a lot of um, great apes. It's in um, certain whales, certain dolphins, elephants, mm, yeah. I think I hit them all. Um, and so they're actually um, quite like uh, simple looking. They're, they're really long with not a lot of like dendritic branches, but they're like highly localized in um, certain parts of the brain, like the anterior insula um, and the uh, dorsal anterior cingulate. So um, in these brain regions that are um, a lot of times associated with um, social um, perceptions, self-awareness sometimes, time mm -hmm. perception sometimes. I mean, they do a lot of things. It's also parts of the brain that um, integrate information about um, visceral sensation, including heart rate. So there's like also a big mm -hmm. theory about it from evolution when the vagus nerve was developed. Um, uh, and that's in mammals. So you wouldn't have it in the whale shark, which I think you were trying to get at before. <laughs> um, but they would be in, in whales. Um, but yeah, cool. this like this more yeah. direct link to heart rate and to facial cranial nerves. Um, oh yeah. Yeah. So all these things kind of coming together in these areas. And, um, the idea is that these highly social animals, um, have to integrate much more information right, right. about their environment because social information is very complex and you have to yeah. represent like the uh, goals of another creature uh, relative to yourself. Um, yeah, so, the, so I'll say one last thing. With Dunbar's hypothesis too for brain development and then uh, whales do confirm this. I saw a study recently. They thought that the expansion of the neocortex, so uh, like the, you know, the frontal lobes, right? Well, it's all the whole cortex, but a lot of the expansion of the frontal lobes as well, they find through evolution to be almost like perfectly linearly correlated with the, um, the size of a social like pack or whatever. So like you could see as um, like humans map onto this quite nicely they like the size of, the, of social relationships maintained in like a group of monkeys etc um 
through all the different species uh, is linearly correlated with the size of their neocortex. And for humans, that size is something like 250. And they confirm that through like looking at people's um, active Facebook relationships maintained, like the, not the number of friends, oh, but the number of connections. Yeah, you I actively... heard this. I did hear about this recently. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And mm-hmm. for whales, it does have like well, whale neocortex is much larger than ours. Um, it does correlate um, linearly to a certain point, and then it drops off a little bit. But um, I think they explain it by like complexity of feeding behaviors and stuff too, um, mm-hmm. like if they hunt. But okay, so yeah, mm-hmm. I'll shut up. Man, I really want. I really want to watch this dash cam video. Yeah, <laughs> the, the whale dash cam. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So I, so what I what I'll say briefly in response to that is it will probably be really hard for for the large whales. When you say like whale brain this and that, yeah. I'm wondering if I'm wondering what whales those were because baleen whales, which are the whales I study, those are the big filter feeders like this one. Uh-huh. Um, are similar but different to like the whales that are behind you, the beluga whales, which are also whales, but they're toothed whales. Anyway, yeah. but but I bet there's information on whale brains from whaling stations and whaling records. So we actually know a lot about internal anatomy of large whales because we used to cut them up and to some degree still do. Mm. Um, and so we can maybe get some information on brain parameters if you were interested. That would be Absolutely. more track, that would be more tractable and putting an EEG on a whale, which is like, would be awesome, but I think would be really hard, but it'd be so cool if we could do it. Yeah, but, I mean, I'd rather study in vivo than a dead whale, but yeah. Yeah, same, yeah. same. Yeah. But anyway, dash cam video, I agree. Uh-huh. Let's look at it, let's look at a dash cam okay. video. So um, so the things that you should notice in the, in the data here is this red vertical line, that's where we are in the video. And you'll see it as I press play, you'll see it moving to the right. And cool. um, this, uh, this green, uh, little squiggly line here, that's speed. Um, this blue line is depth. And this uh, pink line is what's known as a uh, jerk, uh, which is just the second derivative of, of acceleration. So what that means is like when, ac- when, when acceleration is changing rapidly, you'll see a peak in that jerk signal. And oh, cool. what's happening here, what you'll see is a feeding event. Um, what's cool though, is you'll see it's a dual feeding event because a lot of times these blue wells are feeding in pairs. And so one of the things that we're looking at, not me personally, but a, someone we work with is what is the relationship of these pairs to each other? So I'll play this dash cam video and um, keep in mind, this is an animal the size of an air, of the size of like a commercial airplane. It's like, you know, 90 feet long and like, you know, weighs 200,000 pounds. Um, so this is humongous animal, but so we're on the back of one whale, but the actual real action is happening because he's filming or she is filming uh, its friend here. And they're gonna rush forward and take a huge gulp of water and krill. And when they do that, their huge expandable mouth pouch opens. And that's that huge pouch that you're seeing there. And you can actually see the leftover krill, the krill that made it this time flying past the camera there. Um, And this volume in their pouch can actually, when they fully extend it, uh, equal or exceed the volume of the entire animal without the pouch extended. So it's, it's, it's a really impressive behavior. Um, and we can tell it in the data record because of this for, for a number of different ways, but one, this, this peak and jerk, cause that's when they like lunge, they, they scream forward and take a big gulp, but also, uh, when that speed record decreases. So you can imagine like a drag racer, uh, or like a fast, like a, like a really fast car that opens up a parachute behind it. And then that's what this is, except the parachute is the mouth and it's in front. So the speed drops off like that associated with these, they often roll. So you can see a, a, a roll signal, an acceleration signal and a speed signal. And that often all altogether um, uh, shows that uh, a feeding event is happening. So here's another like example. This is from a fin whale, but same general idea, except with some numbers. Um, so the fin whale will rush forward, take a huge gulp. Um, and in this pouch here for this fin whale, there might be 60 cubic meters of water. And in the blue well video that we just showed, it might be hundred cubic meters of water. And to give you an idea um, about the size of that, uh, one cubic meter is about the weight of a pickup truck. So, um, so for 60 meter, 60 cubic meters, that'd be about like 60 pickup trucks worth of water. And um, uh, for blue well, it could be like up to hundred uh, pickup trucks worth of water. They, um, they can taste like, yeah, that's a great. That is a really great question. Here's a cool picture of a of a whale mid gulp. You can see the eye right here. Uh, there's the eye. Um, 
you can see the baleen plates. So this is what they filter. This is like their coffee filter. This is in the top of the mouth here. They have nothing in the bottom of the mouth. They have no teeth uh, they, at all, but they have no baleen at the bottom either. So when they filter, it's actually like you can imagine them sort of smiling and then they use their tongue. Once they have that big pouch and they close their mouth, they use their tongue and muscles in the, the pouch, we think, to sort of push the, the, the mass of engulfed water uh, through this, this filter plate here. Um, and then hopefully the krill stays behind and uh, most, if not all the water is expelled and then they swallow. Um, and they'll do that hundreds of times a day uh, when they're feeding. So it's really an amazing behavior and really cool to kind of get a, get a look into the lives of these whales. I'll give you one, one last, uh, actually we have others too that I'll show if, if we want, but uh, another cool video. So the first one was a blue whale eating krill but this one is a humpback, and these are all from Monterey. So this is like, you know, like a couple miles from my house. It's really cool. Um, but anyway, same idea, except this is a humpback whale. And this humpback whale is, um, there's an annoying sound on this one, sorry. But anyway, this humpback whale is feeding sympatrically with dolphins, with white-sided dolphins, cool. um, and it's gonna eat fish. And so it comes in, there's a ball of fish, and it will take a gulp, and you see the fish that survived flying by the uh, <laughs> the camera there. Um, so we just have like endless, you know, hours and hours, like probably hundreds of thousands of hours of, uh, uh, of stuff like this. Um, and when I say we, it's really like this huge group effort of like dozens of people to collect these data. Uh, while we're here, I'll just, don't worry about these. This, blah, blah, blah. Well, data. can I ask you about then, like, I know I've kind of bothered you about this before because of my own personal biases, but like collaboration across species, cooperation during feeding versus competition, like what kinds of behaviors are you seeing manifest? So, so we definitely see things that you might describe as cooperation, but it's hard to assign consciousness to it, I think. Yeah. And this would be a question I'd have for you, right, is so we see it's very, very common in Monterey Bay here. And I'll play this video to exemplify it, to see things like sea lions, which are all these guys and humpback whales feeding together. And, and the, the mutualism that's occurring there, just to give you pause this video and I'll show you what's going on here, but this huge dark area, that's an enormous uh, school of anchovy. Mm. And it's because of, of uh, the way more abundant predators that eat individual fish. And those are things like dolphins, sea lions, birds, etc. And if you're a fish, a schooling fish, the way to protect yourself against a predator that eats you individually is to bunch up in a school. Mm -hmm. So that's why they're schooling, right? Like this. Mm -hmm. But the one predator that not only does not protect you from, but makes you at more danger from mm -hmm. is, are these large bulk feeders like this humpback whale. So this humpback whale then rushes forward and takes a, takes a bite of uh, this school of anchovy, mm -hmm. right? Um, and show you one more video. This is a different species. This is not our video, um, but it's also feeding. Does fish. that help the sea lion at all? Because it'll make them like kind of shoot in other directions, like possibly. Yeah. So this, so this is what I'm saying, right? Is that yeah. there's definitely these, these interactions, which can certainly be described as, as a mutualism. Mm -hmm. Um, and there may be competitive aspects to it. There may be, um, altruistic aspects to it, you know, but it, how do you assign, uh, emotional sort of cognitive states to these behaviors, but it definitely is beneficial for the whales that they have birds and sea lions and dolphins and other things that cause these fish or krill, whatever it is to bunch up, which yeah. then makes it uh, more of a more valuable resource for a large filter feeder, like a whale to feed on. So, you know, um, yeah, it's all very interesting. I don't know how you actually assign, uh, intent like, or something yeah yeah exactly yeah yeah I mean I don't know if you necessarily have to assign the intent um like I don't think people necessarily assign intent to like bonomos or something when they do something helpful for another animal it's kind of like yeah you can stay away from that idea entirely and still observe like well what is like most intrinsic to their nature um and like for bonobos um the their survival relevancy has been about sharing. Um, and it's just becomes like, I, maybe just like, it's just a part, like their most automatic behavior, like the most deeply ingrained one. So they will actually go and assist other species um, if and when they can without any benefit to themselves. Um, there's like experiments mm. where they like have a cage and put some food up top that's like tied up 
and they let in some other monkey, not a bonobo, just different species. And right. that monkey can't get up top and get the food, but he wants the food. And then they let a bonobo go outside the cage and the bonobo will realize what's going on and it'll climb up because it can and drop the food for the other monkey and not, yeah. you know, not get it for themselves. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so there's, there are lots of anecdotal um, and this is the issue when you have like these large uh, animals in in the wild is how you can't you can do an, a controlled experiment certainly like that right which would be mm -hmm. ideal mm -hmm. um, but you just can't do it um, but there's tons of anecdotal evidence of like for example humpback whales protecting uh, sea lions or something of that nature from a killer whale yeah because um, yeah. killer whales are these ultimate predators right uh, killer whales will eat other whales they'll eat sharks they'll eat everything killer whales are unbelievably impressive animals, also highly social, um, which is how killer whales are able to hunt things like great white sharks and giant whales because killer whales hunt in packs. Anyway, mm -hmm. point is there's loads of anecdotal evidence, uh, just observations of what appears to be sort of interspecies protection where humpback yeah. whales to no benefit to themselves, if anything, maybe even a slight danger, but humpback whales, once they're you know, adults, they can't size. really be, yeah. yeah, they're, they're so big. They can't, but, but, but killer whales will eat, Babies. uh, humpback whale calves for sure. Yeah. In fact, the, the killer whales we have in Monterey specialize on eating gray whale calves often when they come back on their migration back to Alaska. Um, so, but, you know, again, how much of that is, is people, and, and, you know, there'll be like some National Geographic story on this and some video of like, oh, humpback whale saves sea lion from predation. And it's just mm -hmm. like, yeah, maybe. I mean, it's cool. It's neat. It's a neat observation. Can't, can't deny that, but I don't know. It's tough. Here, I don't know. How about this? In line with some of the research you sent me, if they remember, if they maintain a memory, a trauma, because I think there's plenty of evidence that whales yeah. endure yeah. trauma when their child is taken from them or killed. Totally. Right? Oh, absolutely. If they oh, maintain yeah. memory of that from their youth, which you have, you sent me evidence of them maintaining yep. long-term memory of trauma, right? Um, yep. Could they then like uh, be wanting, like the, wanting to protect the sea lion be mm -hmm. out of out of some relation to that, or they have a grudge against like the uh, the, <laughs> may, may, well, the, so the the other whale. Yeah. Or I don't know. It, or, or like, or they're just like, they want to ward off the killer whales overall. Like whenever they can like, you know, assert dominance, maybe they, yeah, I, they do. Yeah, I think it's totally plausible. I just don't know how, I think it, this is why I think it'd be really interesting to, to like dive deep into the neuroscience aspect of it. Because of course, people like, like us, we don't have any expertise in this. Um, mm -hmm. And so where the rubber meets the road for us is like, okay, well, you know, we saw this cool thing or like, we know this cool thing kind of happens with some frequency, but yeah. you know, we're ecologists, we're physiologists, we're, you know, whatever fisheries biologists, we don't know how the brain works basically. Yeah. Okay. So one thing from, um, so animals that work in groups that hunt don't always share the spoils. Humans and bonobos share spoils. Um, uh, primate, uh, well, chimpanzees don't evenly share, um, and they have like a code for this, but they don't always, e they don't have this conception of even sharing, but like when humans engage in collaborative hunting, um, right. they, no matter if one of them did most of the work, say, because they all engage in this task together, they will evenly divide it. Um, so, and part of like building like a repertoire um, with your pack is like having trust and building like a reputation at some point, right? So there's, mm. um, if if the uh, blue whales or humpback whales do have some sort of collaboration with the sea lions in that hunting, they might be forming some type of reputation in which they then would want to uphold perhaps if like the sea lions in danger. I don't know. I mean, this is totally like, you know, going way far ahead of what we have with this information, but like, yeah, because yeah. they are highly social animals and there is like obvious collaboration, it isn't too far of a stretch to think that they, um, are creating relationships and have right. reputations with one another. What are you guys laughing about? Nothing. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> just, see, this is this is the problem when when you know when Marion and I talk because we just get really excited about this stuff and then you know. I am what, excited. What, does, does the it's all very interesting? That's what I was laughing. <laughs> yeah, I had no idea that when Free Willy 
busted out at the end and he's gonna eat a baby <laughs> yeah yeah killer whales are, are are truly the ocean's top predator they, and don't people, they come for fun can sometimes can i ask you another they, question can yeah. i ask another question um well my first question was yeah live whale second question um can we move the whale to some other ocean and see how they behave like I, can we make the, can we displace displace the whale for to see in what context i mean the the short answer to that question is no there's but, no way to do experiment right yeah, yeah. you cannot make a giant pool right to make like to measure all these stuff about a whale and then get data points can yeah. we move the whale to another ocean that it that they're not familiar to it's just like an immigration you'd probably like kill a, them now like it'd be yeah so you know, full displacement and then see how they behave are they going to do the same thing i don't know if the the environment is going to be the same so are they going to adjust it easily yeah different kinds of fish around them yeah so it's a it's a it's a great question i mean i think almost all the stuff we know about you know cetaceans which are the, which is the fancy word for whales and the reason why i bring this up i should have shown this earlier but but basically these are all the whales in the world this this collage and the ones that are facing to the left those are all the toothed whales those are things like killer whales and sperm whale sperm whale is the largest tooth predator to ever live we think that's this uh, large one at the top here this is a killer whale right there um but all dolphins are in there, all porpoises are in there. And so yes, all dolphins, porpoises, sperm whale, whatever, those are all whales, dolphins are whales. Um, mm -hmm. And they're all tooth whales, they have teeth, just like we have teeth. Now all the whales facing to the, uh, to the right on the left side of the picture here, these are the baleen whales. This is primarily what we study. These are these enormous filter feeding animals that don't have teeth, they have baleen and they filter with that baleen. Baleen is made of the same thing as our fingernails made of keratin. Mm -hmm. um, and so to answer your question, we know a lot about some of the smaller toothed whales, some of these, these ones here, because you can take them into captivity. You can put various instruments on them. You can actually do to some degree manipulative experiments in like a large tank with these whales uh, being like dolphins and porpoises and things of that nature. Uh, these little guys that are about the size of a person. See, there's a person silhouette there to give you an idea of scale. Mm -hmm. But for these whales, I mean, how could you ever move it? I mean, the, the larger ones here um, are, like I said, they're the size of a commercial airliner. Um, so, Well, yeah. we can technically move the airplanes. <laughs> yeah, well, so a, a lot of what's happening now is after whaling, and we could talk about whaling, but after oh, whaling, yeah. um, whales are recolonizing certain areas. So there's a lot of these like natural experiments that are happening. The greatest experiment, when I say great, it doesn't, don't equate that with good. The greatest experiment was whaling because in a lot of these oceans, we removed whales. And then you can kind of see the effect that whales had on certain ecosystems by removing them all. And now they're in some places returning in some places not, but in the places where they're returning, you can see what effects they're having. So it's kind of like what you're describing except we can't really control where they're going and why, you know, like they just are reappearing or doing well or not doing well. And we can figure out or try to figure out why that is the case. Um, right. I mean, this is all inspired by um, your potential future collaboration because Marion was, and you were talking about social um, interactions and collaboration and all of that. And then one way of finding if there's any trace of, social interaction in these veils is like would be just like studying those who were displaced yeah right? have you and seen the, blackfish because like uh that's me it, that's i don't know if you have opinions on that documentary but that showed me like the the mother was like they separated a mother and a baby and the mother was making calls to her young like mm -hmm. and like she was doing long distance range ones too yeah. like non-stop it, it was just I don't know. Yeah. I've seen videos, sorry, of um, of like Japanese boats hunting dolphin. My God, I this is one of the yeah. most like painful things I've ever seen because they bring it all the way to shore and trap yeah. it and it can't go anywhere and yeah. and it's making sounds to its friends on the other side and it's 
you could see the panic you like I, I it's just like it's very hard to watch that and not think like I know exactly what that panic what that is that's like oh yeah <laughs> tra- yeah I don't know yeah it's, it's just- it, right it's hard to know exactly what they're going through but it, I think it is we can we can say with you know it's hard to say with confidence because again we, how do you yeah. know exactly but um they definitely have high level cognitive function for sure all these Absolutely. animals on this page have high level cognitive function um many of them are social uh some of them uh in terms of like for example killer whales or sperm whales um are highly high like incredibly social um they have advanced uh communication uh incredible languages dialects so like humpback whales that's these guys here um in the middle uh that's a baleen whale uh, they, uh, they have dialects, which I guess as far as I understand it, and I'm not a linguist, so this may be wrong, but as far as I understand it is similar to not like a different language, but, you know, a British English or American English or something along those lines. Like right? a where, cultural manifestation of it. Yeah, like, yeah. yeah, yeah, no, exactly. To the point where you can give a computer, like AI, computer software, like a humpback whale from like feed it, a, feed it a song from this population or feed it a song from this population. And it can assign, you know, this humpback whale came from this group or that group because of the way it talks. Um, what's, what's also interesting, if you want to talk about whale language, is these larger whales uh, from sperm whales, all the way blue whales, all the baleen whales, um, to, be, to make a loud sound, you have to be big. Um, uh, that helps making a large sound. You need to have a large vocal apparatus to, to, to physically produce that sound. Also, um, the way water acts as a medium, this, it's, it's much denser than air water is, right? And so sound travels much more efficiently and much further in water than it does in air. It breaks down quicker in air and travels better in water. So these large animals, things like blue whales, fin whales, these animals of this nature, uh, theoretically uh, have songs that can travel hundreds of kilometers um, in, in the water. And one of the things that uh, our lab is looking at now, and again, it's not my lab, it's my boss's lab, but you know, the whole thing. Uh, a, a cool grad student project is basically figuring out what the role is of long range communication for, blue, for, for coordinating blue whale migration. Um, so basically like, we know these whales call, um, the blue whales, uh, that's, that's one of the main whales we study. That's this one at the top. And uh, what's interesting is that they do, it's not random when they call. So when they're here feeding, I'll show, go back to this quickly. But so this is from one of our tags. So they spend all day feeding. And as you'll notice, they're feeding shallower and shallower in the water at night as night approaches. And the reason for that is because the, 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 the plankton, the krill that they're eating all, vertically migrates in the water column. So this is them actually sort of following mm-hmm. their food toward the surface as it gets from afternoon to dusk to twilight and then into night. Now you notice at night it's not feeding at all. So what's it doing? Well, it's recuperating and digesting because digesting takes a lot of energy. And keep in mind when they're feeding, almost all their energy is expended on the, the physical movements to actually generate that feeding. But then at night we think they're spending a lot of time digesting, but also we know from our tags and from other acoustic monitoring arrays, they're spending a lot of time singing. They sing a lot at night. Um, that's when they sing. And um, we don't, they don't really, sleep. well, you know, I mean, it's not that they're all singing all the time. Okay. We think mostly males, we don't know if it's exclusively males, mostly males are, are the ones that are singing. Um, uh, you know, what does it mean? It's not all males singing Maybe at all times. Maybe they're just humming to themselves to sleep. Like, no one knows. Maybe they are. No Our baby knows. does that when he when he wakes up at night and when he's trying yeah. to come back to sleep. He's just like, oh. I mean, I you know, I think I think that's one of the great parallels between this this type of work and and neuroscience work is like the brain is also so mysterious. It's like one of the if not the most charismatic organ. It's certainly one of the most charismatic organs in the body. And like, think about how little we know about it, right? I mean. Uh, you know, I, I, I take SSRIs for, for depression and like, we don't even have any idea how those work really. I mean, we know how they work, but we don't really know, you know. Oh like no, we you, don't know. <laughs> like when, yeah, when you go to a psychiatrist and they're like, okay, you know, we suggest you take this medicine. And they're like, there's like a 40% chance it does nothing for you. It's like, okay, great. You know, like, and we don't really know. Oh, what a great way to end this podcast. <laughs> no, no, no. Well, I, 
Well, I did. I definitely wanted to talk about these other two things if you have more time, because now I'm excited. And I, I know. And I want you to talk about whale PTSD too. <laughs> can I pee first? And then you can edit that out. And then I can come back and we can talk about PTSD and- Yeah, while you pee, I'm going to show Zach and Eisner an audio recording of a beluga whale mimicking human speech, because okay, it sounds perfect. like they're making fun of us. I need to also go, I'm gonna go to the bathroom too. You hear it? Yeah, this kind of reminds me of that frog cartoon from like 2000. <laughs> it's so funny. It's like, don't, yo, no, no. They think we're dumb. <laughs> Good kazoo. That's crazy. Yeah, it's pretty cool. With the Is that the specific kid that he's making fun of? <laughs> no, I just try to find like a picture of a beluga whale just so uh, people would know what a uh, which whale was in that thing. So I'm sharing. Um, yeah, I was so Matt had sent me like um, an article on whale potential like PTSD, and they like were studying cortisol levels and they are able to extract information about the cortisol levels of whales throughout time, like 30 years back by taking um, like what they were calling earplugs, but something that like develops within the ear over time. I don't know, to me, I was thinking like earwax or something, um, but it like, it had, they had to take it from a dead whale. And it, because of like the nature of this, thing <laughs> it like traps a lot of like whatever is being excreted in there so you can see almost like rings on the tree like um like levels of different i guess hormones or in this case really? cortisol. yeah matt should explain it because uh, i was having a hard time following the whole paper for a while when they were saying earplugs i was like oh cool are they giving whales earplugs because the sonar or, like the the ships make noises that bother them but no <laughs> wasn't like that so Matt could definitely say but he was trying to tell me oh which I'm talking a little about the PTSD study you can do this but oh yeah no, the fact I mean, that I, I, well, have a oh, memory of whaling right that they yeah yeah, well, 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 yeah we could def I, I'd, I'd love to talk about that because it's a fascinating idea and I think it's quite possible I could yeah. totally buy it um but I actually what I want to know and I would ask I would start out by asking you a question is one of my frustrations about various mental health things is people throw around, the, you know, the the everyman who is now off the screen, so I can talk about him behind his back. Um, uh, the everyman throws around word uh, acronyms. I shouldn't say things like P oh I have oh I have PTSD or oh I have OCD or oh I have AD I have ADHD, and it's just like a lot of a lot of that, a lot of that is BS. And some people do have those problems, and it's a shame then because you just get like when someone is like overly fastidious about the neatness of their house or something like that. Like, oh, I totally have OCD about where this goes. It's like, no, you know, I know people with OCS, OCD and like, it's just actually like serious and like sad condition. So what, yeah, like I understand. Well, anyway, I, when we talk about PTSD, I don't want to get into that framework. So how are yeah. you thinking of it? Okay. Um, the way I conceive of PTSD, um, Okay, I, I want to think about the simplest way to say this, but like the state space modeling, I think is like the coolest way to think about it. But basically like your brain is always trying to predict threats in the environment. That's like one of its number one functions. You know, we have that uh, represented and re-represented at many levels across the brain from, you know, brainstem up into areas of the neocortex, right? Um, you engage in different degrees of generalization of fears as well as like like being way more specific with certain ones with ptsd you have a traumatic event um that was so deeply unpredictable to you it caused such mm -hmm. a large prediction error it was such a shock to the whole system and it was so significant and so threatening um that your brain potentially is um prescribing threat information across every bit of sensory stimulus that was coming up in that moment, many of okay. which might not have actually been dangerous other cause. And not only that, because it was such a serious event, uh, your brain might be queuing up, 
queuing it up a lot it, because it was so relevant perhaps to process it in different ways or because so many things are now hmm. triggering it because it has so many entry points to activating it. And then every time you recall uh, a memory, no matter what the memory is, every time you recall one, it becomes labile, um, meaning that it can be changed. And so new things that happen hmm. while that memory is labile um, can become associated with it and then restored with mm. that memory. So there's no memory that's like perfect. Um, there's no memory that's an exact representation of the events that happened. Every time yeah. you recall a memory, it will be changed and resaved. Um, so oh, the idea with PTSD, okay. yeah, with PTSD that could snowball in the wrong direction where now if you start recalling these threatening events um, in environments that might be safe, and right. you are hyperactivated and you are scared, you might then start prescribing that threat sensation to more and more things that actually aren't threatening. Um, but you can use that same system to update the fears in ways that are um, you know, calming for you. So if you activate the threat memory uh, within a safe environment and you are do feel safe and you maybe even do things to regulate your physiological expression, um, then you can then learn through more and more exposures and uh, like dampen the connections. Uh, between that memory and, okay. and the physiological response. Okay. Yeah, that's that from the reconsolidation helpful. work. Yeah. Uh, all right. Let me first say for your listeners that uh, whaling was a really, really, really significant thing. When I say whaling, I don't mean subsistence whaling of you know indigenous communities. I mean industrial whaling, um, where it's like what you're imagining in terms of like the, the word industrial, uh, it's like that, but for, um, but for whaling, it was perfected really in the early 20th century. Um, and once we developed the technology to actually um, approach, attack, surround, and um, access whale populations, many of which were in the Southern Ocean, that's the ocean surrounding Antarctica, um, I mean, once once the technology was there, they could just be easily, they were like sitting ducks. But what protected them for so long, up until literally only about 100 years ago, and some populations even less than 100 years ago, uh, was just like how remote they were. Like they're like out in the middle of the Southern Ocean. You know, how are you going to, how does it make financial sense? Because again, it all boils down to money. How does it make financial sense to build the ships, send the ships to the end of the earth, collect enormous whales, bring them back, process, I mean, just like, it's a crazy sort of thing when you think about it, but um, we were doing it for a long time. Initially in the 19th century and, and before, uh, we were using it for oil. So uh, there's a common phrase that uh, whale oil basically lit up Europe. Uh, whale oil was the light in street lamps for uh, Europe for um, quite some time in the 18th, uh, yeah, in the 1700s and 1800s. And the reason for that is because whale oil burned really clean, burned really bright, um, it was just like a really useful oil, um, but whale oil was replaced in the early, uh, in the mid 1800s by kerosene. And then kerosene was the main oil used to light the lamps of the world, uh, you know, light the street lights and light, light everything uh, once kerosene was invented in the, in the mid 1800s. But after that, we kept on hunting whales because we realized that we had all these different uses for whale blubber and whale, you know, various whale parts. Um, we used like women's corsets were made out of baleen, um, you know, like all this stuff. And, and, but what's sad about it, uh, and actually for a long time, margarine, uh, margarine was made out of like processed whale blubber. Oh um, God. yeah. So, but what's really sad about it to me anyway, is for the majority of the industrial whaling era, uh, we didn't need to be doing this. Um, like, it's not like this was an essential thing that we needed. Um, it was kind of like, well, we can use the whales, so why don't we? And, and we did. Um, I will uh, quickly share my screen here. Let me see if I can get to, ah, here we go, perfect. Um, do, 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 do. Let's see, all right, yeah. Okay, so these are just some, some whaling catch records. And what you'll see here um, is time is on the x-axis. On the left y-axis is how many whales there were, uh, again, over time. And then the, these red bars is how many whales we were catching in each given year. 
And there's really great records of this because a lot of it was pretty recent. Um, so this is Southern Ocean blue whales. And um, in the, at the turn of the 20th century, there was somewhere between three and 400,000 blue whales. Um, and then by the start of World War I, there was a less than 100,000 blue, uh, sorry, the start of World War II, my bad. There was less than 100,000 blue whales. And then by 1970, there was almost no blue whales. They, this was the most depleted population. They went from um, about 350,000 individuals in 1900 to about 1,000 individuals in 1970. So in less than 100 years, uh, we removed uh, over 99.7% of all blue whales on the planet, um, of all Southern Ocean blue whales um, uh, on the planet. And actually blue whales in general had a similar fate. This is North Atlantic blue whales, same kind of idea, just smaller numbers because there was less of them. So started out around 100,000 blue whales in the mid 1800s. And then by 1960, there was almost none in the North Atlantic. Uh, so, but the Southern Ocean just had much, much, much larger numbers of, uh, of whales than the other than the other regions did, but this this trend you know you can see almost everywhere right I mean like here here are gray whales actually gray whales is one of the great uh, conservation stories there, there was tens of thousands of gray whales we hunted them almost to extinction and they were protected and now we see gray whales very commonly off the coast of uh, California um, so there are some success stories there but whaling was incredibly pervasive and incredibly effective in the 20th century. Um, and whaling was happening to an extreme degree during our parents' lifetimes. So like not that long ago is the point, right? When you think about like this exploitation of various animals, like when you think about the buffalo is another, is a great example of it, and a terrestrial example. Um, we did a very similar thing to buffalo, but that was happening in the mid, mid, uh, 1800s. So we don't know, that was not that it was so long ago. It was actually also quite recent, but we don't know anyone alive who would have been alive during that time. The thing that's incredible about whaling, I mean, look at when these whales were harvested. This is like, our parents were alive during this time, you know, and like, we were like actively decimating these whales. It's crazy. Anyway, um, so uh, what I will show you now are a couple cool studies that say like, obviously there were huge effects uh, on whaling uh, to the whale populations, right? Th 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 those are the most obvious ones, right? Like we went out, to where whales used to be and there are no more whales. What's going on? Well, the answer is we killed them all. So there are those um, obvious sort of acute effects of uh, hunting, right? I mean, it's you hunt something and if you hunt too much of it, it's not there anymore. That's obvious, right? What's less obvious and really kind of, this I think is just so fascinating is um, this is a really cool paper that came out a couple of years ago. And uh, these are researchers who uh, have studied whale earwax <laughs> yeah. So cool. Yeah, whale earwax. So whales uh, do have ears, and but the ear, the external ear holes are closed, so they don't have external ear holes like we do, and so they do produce earwax. But what happens is it just kind of builds up over the entire course of their lives, and then it can be sampled like a tree ring. Um, yeah. So for and and they're like pretty big, these, and they're called earplugs. They're called you know whale earplugs. And there's like a whole field of research of people that study whale earplugs. It's amazing. And they're pretty big. And you can take little slices of them, just like you would a tree ring. And the living whale? Sorry. No, or no, it has to be dead. It has to be dead. Okay. Has to be dead. Yeah, because yeah, you have to like cut it out of its head. Okay. Um, yeah, so they have to be dead. But again, keep in mind, like that was no problem because we were hunting whales like crazy yeah. up until like almost the 80s or 90s in some cases, you know? So like... So, you know, it's not like there's any shortage of, the question is, did you actually bother to like Save it. break into the skull and, and get the earplug out? That's the real yes. question, but there's no shortage of available earplugs. Okay. Um, so anyway, so this study took a bunch of these earplugs and sampled them along this timeline for cortisol. And cortisol is just a stress hormone. Frankly, you probably know more about it than I do. I'm almost sure that you do. Um, the general way I think about it is more cortisol means more stress, but I'm sure it's like way more complicated than that. Um, and I know- I can give a little bit. So please, cortisol please do, is- Please do. 
Yeah, cortisol is involved with sleep wake, wake cycles. So there's a natural flow to cortisol throughout the day, but cortisol is like selectively like um, activated or you know potentiates uh, when you have a stressor in your environment. Um, and when you have chronic stressors, there's a dysregulation of cortisol. And the other special thing about cortisol is that it um, is a quite small molecule well, not a molecule, but whatever thing it is, and it can like flow right through uh, the membrane and go directly to um, the, right through the nucleus to the genes, and mm. it can uh, change activation of genes, and that's quite useful because it can change like the productions of the, and like neurohormones or things you need to respond. But when that happens chronically over time, um, it can perhaps lead to depressive phenotypes, deep PTSD, other yeah. things that it yeah. can actually, yeah. um, if you're pregnant, it can affect the gene activation in the baby and give them proclivity towards depression and PTSD later in life. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. this is all, this is all super, I mean, I never know what to say. Super cool. I mean, it's, it's super interesting. It's mm -hmm. sad, but interesting. Right. Oh so yeah. This, so this is the key, I think, figure from this paper, which I think is so cool. Again, cool. I don't ever know how to say this, but it's very, it's fascinating. There's no doubting that. Um, okay. So in the, again, to orient here, we have the decades on the x-axis here going all the way back to 1870 and all the way, I don't understand what this, few, why there's, anyway, there shouldn't be, it should, just imagine 1870 to present. Okay. okay. So on the left y-axis, you have uh, essentially some measure of cortisol. And on the right y-axis in blue, you have how many whales were killed during that period of time. Now, what's interesting is um, there is a really strong um, correlation between when more whales were caught and the baseline corrected cortisol, right? So in yeah. periods of time, when more whales were caught, the earplugs from those whales, and this is, you know, uh, this, is, this was shown across a number of individuals, correlated pretty sharply with how many whales were caught. That's the purpose of this graph, except, and this is the cool potential PTSD thing, I think, mm -hmm. is except in this period of World War II. So, so during World War II, we stopped killing whales to kill each other instead. And um, however, what you'll notice is that the black is this cortisol metric and it actually deviates in the opposite direction from whaling, right? So you see a dip in whaling, during the early 40s, because again, we weren't focused on killing whales, we were too busy killing each other. And there was a peak though in whale stress. And so what is going on there, right? And this paper goes and talks about how there is loads of marine activity, marine ordnance de de detonation, ships all over the world, um, doing all kinds of war activities and things of that nature. And a lot of these, uh, these uh, whale earplugs were from the Northern Oceans actually. So where there would have been submarines and explosions and air fights and God only knows what else, but nothing that's like immediately destructive to the whale or very, very little whaling. Um, however, if you associate anthropogenic noise with like, oh shit, five, 10, 30 years ago, that meant like these things were gonna come and kill me and kill my mother. Um, presumably that'd freak you the hell out, right? Um, and then after World War II, there was a huge explosion in whaling. The 50s and 60s were the biggest whaling decades. And so you see spikes in both whaling numbers and spikes in cortisol levels. So really just the coincidence of these trends short of World War II is really what's so fascinating here. Um, and then, uh, yeah, and then moving forward, there is less and less whaling, but we think there's like various other disruptions like climate disruption and things like that, which are leading to these oh. trends off the graph. So, but the real fascinating thing here is basically if you look at between 1900 and 1972, which is when whaling stopped, industrial whaling uh -huh. stopped, uh, to, see how, to see how these graphs move in concert is really amazing. Yeah. Um, with the exception of World War II, which I think has, and there's a pretty good explanation for that, the one that I, that I just shared. Yeah. Um, and it should be mentioned that these other researchers, again, you can't prove that this is happening, but like the correlation is undeniable. It's very statistically robust and they tested other drivers, um, that could have, uh, led to these different swings in, in cortisol levels and none did as good of a job as correlating it to how much the whales were hunted. Um, so that just seems to be like the most likely explanation and it makes a lot of sense. Um, another way to look at the data is here, and basically it shows that there is a really strong correlation with an R-squared of almost 80%, which is crazy high for an ecological study. Um, 
I know like for a physicist, they would like vomit at this R squared, but for a ecologist, this is incredibly good. For um, a psychologist, that's like unattainable. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Totally. So it sounds similar. Like an R squared of half this would be like totally worth publishing. Yeah, um, anyway, what it is. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Right. So in any case, what you see here is that how much in this on the y-axis is how much whaling there was and on the x-axis is how much cortisol there was. And there's a really nice linear relationship there with the exception of World War II right here, which we talked about mm -hmm. earlier. So um, yeah, it's pretty unbelievable. And the other exception, by the way, um, is World War I when we also weren't hunting whales. So there are these two big deviations where um, cortisol deviated from how much whaling occurred and those were both during World Wars. Um, anyway, so that's pretty cool, but looking at more, well, and again, cool, sad, um, but what's interesting to think about is that it is likely, because these whales can live 50 to, in some cases, 200 years, we think these whales' lifespan is about 100 years, roughly speaking, if they are unmolested, uh, what that means is that some whales that are adult whales today definitely experienced whaling. Some whales that are adult whales today living in the oceans as we are talking right now certainly had parents that were killed by whaling ships. Um, uh, certainly had, you know, certainly their parents, their grandparents, right, were killed by, you know, were harassed and killed by whaling ships. There is no doubt about that. Um, like I said, industrial whaling, the scale of it is, was unbelievable to the point where almost every large whale on earth was was wiped out, certainly in the Southern hemisphere. So can I ask um, when they, yeah. I mean, whales probably don't like venture too far off from their community, right? So would they be like seeing their conspecific being hunted? Totally, yeah. yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. Okay. Um, like, there's lots of sad stories about um, the whalers would, you know, like harpoon a calf or a young animal, oh. and then the mother, or the what would they assume it's the mother, would like come over and like, you know, help it out, whatever, and that's how they would kill the other one, right, or something like that, or like they would be in a pair, like so, you know, oh. this is this is this is like classic human human greed, human horrifying resource exploitation and animal exploitation and things of that nature, taken to like its most horrific degree. But absolutely, no question about it. There's there's loads of stories of that, and they actually, you in some ways. I don't even say it. in some ways it was pretty well known to like use these tactics, you know, like if they're in a group, you know, kill the oldest or slowest or youngest member. And then the other members will come out to try and help it and then kill the rest of them. Um, <sighs> yeah. So that, so that was, so the point is if you're thinking about a PTSD event, you could, I, I mean, how's that for a trigger, right? Watching your entire family get murdered in front of you. Right. Um, yeah. So if, if you even survived, which frankly, a lot of them probably didn't, they probably killed all of them. So in like these group situations. So, yeah. and when they go and hunt these whales, even if it wasn't like a family group or something like that, uh, whales end up in predictable places and high densities to feed, right? So it might yeah. not be like a social thing, but it could be like, a bunch of whales are at the buffet and that's where the whaling boats are going to like go murder all these whales, right? So it's like, maybe it wasn't your mother that was murdered in front of you. And maybe it was like a bunch of your conspecifics that were murdered in front of you. Um, and you ran away. Um, and you basically had to do this every year of your life from like, you know, whatever it was, 1910 to 1970. And then finally it stopped. And then you're still alive today. Right. Um, but for 60 years, it was like, okay, I need to go up here to feed. But I know when that happens, like there's going to be these weird metal whales from above that are like shooting harpoons down on us i mean it's we don't have to get into it but it's like really pretty pretty horrific um had exploding harpoons that was really effective um at killing whales as you might imagine we don't have to talk about that anyway it's sad yeah. let's talk about something that's slightly less sad um, but still fascinating in the same regard so those are acute effects right the idea that like seeing a con specific possibly a family member uh, killed in front of you can give you PTSD, but there's also these sort of chronic sublethal effects that have cool phys that are now we're now seeing physiological responses in, in field collected data, um, which is really exciting. So what happened here in this study? Um, this is these are from modern whales. Um, these whales were studied in the early 2000s, and. In 2001, everyone, particularly people from New York City, know, knows what happened in September 11, 2001. 
Uh, and after September 11th, there was almost a complete halt of ship traffic and air, and air traffic, as you probably remember, following 9-11. And this happened for about three or four days. Um, and it's pretty well known, though it was hard to actually show conclusively that ship noise stressed whales out. Uh, and we're just talking, we're not talking about hunting ships at all. We're talking about commercial ships. We're talking about ferries. We're talking, I mean, any type of just ship in the ocean, just noise. And I'm, and I, I'm almost positive there's, there's human uh, data for this, right? Like if you're, if you're trying to do work and there's a jackhammer going off behind your head, you're like stressed out, even if the jackhammer itself isn't stressing you out, just like loud noise stresses animals out. And that turned out to be the case uh, for, for whales as well. So um, anyway, what's cool is that they collected whale poop, <laughs> one of my favorite things, and they looked at cortisol level in whale poop. So they looked at stress hormone, which is by the time it's pooped out, it's like a pretty immediate record of like, if I pooped out uh, poop with high cortisol level, that means I was stressed out yesterday, you know, or like when I was doing that eating and processing. And so long story short here is- Can I ask the, a question? How yes, do you yes. collect the veil poop? Oh, that's a fast, that's a whole, oof, that's a fun tangent. But basically what these people did was they trained whale poop sniffing dogs to find the whale shit. Shut up. What? Yes, a uh, yes. Uh, there's a picture. I could actually, if, if, if someone, uh, cause I'll continue talking about this, wants to look up, uh, right whale poop sniffing dog or like whale poop sniffing dog. Oh yeah, oh yeah. In the water. Yeah, and the reason is, the reason why they did, why they wasted their wasted their time, you know, I could totally see a Republican congressperson being like, oh my God. this is what we're wasting our money on. But the reason is because poop, poop is a very valuable record, right? It's a record of stress. It's a record of diet. It's a record of DNA. It's a, yeah, so that those, those top pictures. Um, yeah, awesome. so those, so those top pictures, there's, there's stories about it. Oh yeah. And um, yeah, so these right whales are incredibly endangered. Uh, there's only like four or 500 left in the whole world. We, we killed almost all of them. This is a you know common refrain here of this part of our conversation. But in any case, yeah, so they train poop sniffing dogs to collect poop. And they've been doing this for years um, because poop can be hard to find. Uh, whale poop can be hard to find. And so, yeah, so they train these poop sniffing dogs to collect the poop and they've been doing it, but then this natural experiment happened. The natural experiment is 9-11, no ship traffic and very little ocean noise. And what they found was that during the period immediately following 9-11, when there was almost no ocean noise, uh, the whale cortisol level as reflected in their poop uh, dropped like off a table, right? So the whales became as based on the cortisol uh, record way less stressed in the days following 9-11. And then immediately after 9-11, it started to pick back up as ship traffic uh, re reemerged. In, in this is in the Boston Harbor type area. Um, this is a really fascinating paper and I love it because you got the poop sniffing dogs, you got whale poop, you got endangered species, you got all these- Karma, cool you got karma. The humans yeah. get PTSD and get to give the whales a little bit of a break. Yeah. Yeah, you got all, so there's all sorts of cool stuff. I guess this wasn't, yeah, anyway, this might've been the Bay of Fundy, but in any case, less ships, less noise, less stressed whales, right? And what's cool about this is that using this poop record rather than an earplug record, you can actually measure stress of a living and potentially in some cases for these animals, still living animal. Uh, so how else might you measure a stress response? And this is what I'll end on and we can you know end on some discussion of this. But one thing that, um, uh, Jeremy, my boss, has been working on with other collaborators is developing a tag that integrates a heart rate monitor. And uh, so this here is some of the cool data that came out of that. So it should be known that as, or it's relevant for this conversation, that as animals get bigger, their physiological processes tend to slow. Uh, so in other words, uh, a huge blue whale, you'd expect to have a really low heart rate. That's the you know, point here. Whereas like a mouse has like an extremely high heart rate compared to a human and definitely compared to a whale. So we were expecting really low heart rates, but what we saw surprised us. So when these whales are actively feeding, so this is again, one of these sort of depth time records of a tagging event. So the whale was tagged here, then it dove down to you know 150 meters, did some feeding. Um, here's examples of that. So this is the surface, these little excursions where they're doing these loops down at the bottom. That's when they lunge up and take a bite, lunge up and take a bite, and then come back up to the surface. 
So before we actually look at the data, does anyone have any guesses as to what happens to a mammalian heart rate when you dive underwater? This apparently is true for all, well, I don't say all mammals, all mammals that I know of. What do you think happens, even if you're like going down, not just like holding your breath and like floating underwater, but like going underwater and like doing stuff in the case of these um, uh, blue whales are going down underwater and are very seriously exerting themselves. Um, I think I would expect it to slow down to like conserve like energy or something. Like you don't want to use up more resources or oxygen or something when you're going to be in an oxygen deprived environment. Yeah, lay, layman and psych, psych, a psychologist or a psychiatrist, what do, you, what do you think? Developmental psychologist. Developmental psychologist. I would also say I would expect it to go down because you're not breathing in. Yeah, yeah, so, so you're right. I actually, I mean, that's exactly right. It's, this is, you know, talking to smart people, it's like, you already know all the answers. Um, can you still see this? Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. So I have disappointed you by knowing it. Yeah. So yeah, but you're exactly right. And 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 the currency they're trying to conserve is oxygen, um, because mm -hmm. when you take that gulp, uh, the oxygen is like it, that's your that's your currency. That's what feeds your muscles. That's what allows you to do all the things you need to do. That's what feeds your brain, um, to be able to identify when to take a bite and so on. Mm -hmm. So yeah. So when they dive, their heart rate plummets to um, less than a quarter of what it is at the surface. Um, so when they are, uh, lunging, we see the heart rate go up as compared to when they're filtering. So when they're filtering, some of the heart rates, uh, that were, that were measured were among, if not the slowest heart rate ever recorded by any animal ever, in some cases, as low as two beats a minute. Wow. Um, so about like, yeah. Um, more typically it'd be like four to six beats a minute. Um, but yeah, in some cases as low as two beats a minute. Um, and they have also to help them with oxygen, they have a expandable pouch off their aorta or like in their aorta right outside the heart where like essentially one pump of blood can hang out in the aorta fully oxygenated. So it's like a little extra bit of like oxygenated blood that you can, that they apparently can slowly push out into the bloodstream to get a little bit extra oxygen into their body and allows them to dive a little longer and exert themselves a little longer um, while they're underwater diving. And then while they come to the surface, their heart rate starts to race. And then when they're at the surface breathing, and this is, I think, the amazing thing to think about uh, for people like us, because whenever we see a whale, it's at the surface, probably on a whale watching boat. And it's just like, oh, look at that whale. It's like so calm and so, you know, and that might be the case. But one of the things we found is that if they're feeding, um, when those whales are at the surface, it would be the equivalent of any one of us sprinting, you know, as fa fast and as far as we can. And then like that recovery as you're like, you know, hands on your knees, like panting for breath, right? It'd be like a bunch of like boats and cars or whatever it is surrounding you, like taking pictures of you and stuff like that. <laughs> like that's at least the heart rate record. We don't know what their physiology per se is doing or their brains. Um, but the heart rate record suggests that when they are at depth and filtering, their heart is physiologically about as slow as it could possibly get. One of the people, actually the last author on this, he's a heart surgeon. So that was really cool to collaborate with this guy. He's like an engineer and a heart surgeon. So he's like a cardiac doctor, um, but he does marine biology too. He's, he's a very interesting guy. Um, and uh, so one of the things that he sort of figured out from these data, and I don't know, yeah, I, I don't know anything about the heart really, um, was that when they're at depth, the whale's heart rate is about as low as it could ever be. And when they're at the surface while feeding, it's about as fast as it could ever be. So they're in tachycardia at the surface and extreme bradycardia when they're feeding at depth, right? Uh -huh. And this is not, this is only when they're feeding, right? When they're at, when they're, when it's at night and they're just kind of chilling, it's some middle state, you know, it's some like, as we would be talking right now, sitting, hanging out, whatever. But at that the while they're singing. While they're singing, it's probably it's probably more mellow. Their heart, though we've never tagged a singing whale, which could be interesting. Um, or yeah, anyway, I, don't, I guess this whale didn't sing. I don't know. I don't know if we've ever tagged a singing whale with a heart rate monitor. Probably not. But um, the point is, there's lots of cool physiology in, in there. But when these whales are feeding, they're basically doing this incredible aerobic activity as 
demonstrated not just by the, the kinematic data, so the movement data that we find in our tags, but also now as, va as validated by, these, by this physiological data, this heart rate record. Um, and so as this heart rate tag is perfected, um, it could be really interesting to think about what the heart rate can tell us about, I don't know, emotion or, or, or cognition or social behavior or anything like that. Because this, is, this was almost just like a proof of concept paper in a way like this tag works and look at this cool data we can get from it. But now it's like getting it to work well and consistently is, is the challenge, but anyway. This is so cool. Yeah, I, if we were gonna try to look at social behavior and like heart rate synchrony in like the, are they called pods, like the group of whales? Um, yeah, that's what, yeah, but anyway. Yeah, I would wanna look at it during like um, the, the more social period, which might be that singing rest period. Cause then like you were saying, there's a lot more mm. variability there. And so we'd want to try to explain away some of that variance first, like this situation uh, has such external pressure on it. It might be right. hard, like there's probably less variance to explain um, maybe by like the social components. So, so yeah. when they're singing at night, mm -hmm. I would expect there to be like less variation, but they'd st so what's what's interesting, well, yeah, we should talk about this because I think that is within the realm of possibility. If mm -hmm. you could just particular and it could be particularly interesting if you from a psychological neuroscientist background can generate predictions as to what a heart rate might do under these various states. Mm -hmm. And then we just tag a bunch of whales, which we'd probably do anyway, mm -hmm. um, get a bunch of heart rate data, hopefully that's the hard part, and then mm -hmm. be able to say, you know, what happened in these different states. And you can correlate it with singing. You can correlate it with time of year when they're, cause like there's certain times of the year when they're getting like ready to breathe versus when mm -hmm. they're like more interested in feeding. So there's lots of phenological variability at different times of year. So I think if you could generate a couple of coherent predictions as to like, if the social behavior is doing that, then we expect the heart record to do this. Yeah. I think could be quite testable if we can get the heart rate data which is yeah. the hard part, but I think eventually we can get there. And we're kind of there, but not as reliably as, as we'd want. Hell but, yeah. I can't yeah. wait until like five years from now we collaborate on something like this. I'm gonna be so stoked. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like I said, I, think, I honestly think the key is just like coming up with like cool hypotheses. And what's cool is like this work is gonna be, this is what actually attracted me to this lab in the first place is they were collecting all this data um, but they were doing stuff like I do ecology and animal behavior. You obviously do neuroscience. And that's not any of what this group does. What this group does is biomechanics. So basically like the physics uh, and kinematics of like how these whales move around, which is really cool. But yeah. I, I approached my current boss and was just like, we could do some really cool ecology with this. Um, and I think similarly, we could quite easily convince uh, the people I work with to say, why don't we do like a cool cross cutting like neuroscience-y psychology type thing with yeah. these physiological data. I think that would be, I think they'd be really keen on that. So yeah. totally, we should think about it, I think. For the PTSD test too, uh, like you could find if there's, if there's a possibility of them being near like a whaling ship at the time you're recording them and you could not, see- Not whaling, but whale watching. Whale watching. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Because like we know where they are and we know relatively speaking where well watching yeah. boats are particularly at times of day. So like yeah. so it could be like a certain time of day thing. So yeah, I definitely think but they again, could probably discriminate. I mean, it, it might, so that would go back to the generalizations, I guess. Um, but they could, they should be able to discriminate between a whale watching boat and a whaling ship, right? They probably have like really distinct, distinguished yeah, features. And it, yeah. It should also, it should also be mentioned that at this current time, yeah, the number of individuals that actually saw whaling, particularly in the Northern hemisphere where whaling tended to happen earlier, yeah. are probably very limited okay. um, at this point, right? But they could pass it on through language too, right? Yeah, it, well, exactly, yeah. right? And that's the thing. It's like, it didn't happen that long ago though. So maybe like yeah. their parents or their grandparents did. And what we do know from that poop dog sniffing study is that, mm -hmm. yeah, whaling is this extreme thing, right? Where, where you're being hunted and killed um, and tortured, but there are these less extreme things like ocean noise yeah. that stresses them out. In fact, for the blue whales in California, the main thing that is threatening them now is ship strike. So mm -hmm. literally being run over by a ship. Oh. Um, and there, there, are, there are people actually that I know that are working on this from a different perspective, trying to trying to predict where basically the tool is called whale watch, like a weather report. 
like where whales are going to be so ships can avoid those areas or slow down in those areas, things like that. Oh, good. But in any case, what I'm saying is there doesn't have to be whaling to be able to ascribe stress to nearby ships. We yeah. are pretty confident, and there's a number of studies to demonstrate, including that whale poop study, that just like the presence of human activity, noise, ships, disturbance, uh, bothers them at this sublethal chronic level, right? Yeah. And we, and you know, again, I think from human studies, although I'm no expert in this, this is isn't isn't this kind of true of people that live in poor neighborhoods? Like they just are, are it's like harder to concentrate. It's harder to do higher level tasks, um, in part because you know you have air pollution, you have noise pollution, you have crime, you have all this sort of stuff. And it's like how do you focus on doing a good job at your or or being a good you know, in your family or in your community when like you're getting sick from air pollution and when you're being stressed because there's construction happening across the street 24 seven, yeah, and, you know, and so on. So there's yeah. lots of parallels here. Um, you know, both whales and humans are very smart social mammals. So yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of these things are conserved across, across taxa. Yeah, I mean, I think chronic life stress, uh, you don't even have to be like a complex social species to be impacted by, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Also wondering if they are able to learn, you know, like I, if we have, if they have a perception of color or like some, like, I mean, we already discussed this taste, maybe the ship that you approach them when you're observing them, the color of the ship, I don't know if you have a chance to just like use a red ship or like blue one or like a green one or yeah. like put on speakers to just like play some sort of a song when you're watching them over so, time and then some sort of a stimulus you know just like would they be learning that oh this is the safe boat where they play mozart or whatever <laughs> yeah so yeah so this that is the, this is a dangerous one. Oh, this is the one that gives us like really delicious food i don't know if yeah. you're allowed to give them any food because i guess that wouldn't be ethical that wouldn't be observed <laughs> i actually but, think it'd be really hard to get them to know, convince like them to feed of, some sort of modification that you're like you're obviously not in a controlled environment but can you try to modify the stimulus that you have? yeah so i think i think the first thing to do would be what i was describing uh with marianne earlier which would be to kind of look at the data and like try to find some natural correlations like allow for a natural experiment to occur but then i think what you're talking about would be the next step and would be really cool and and doable the hardest part would be the permits, actually, because when you manipulate, that counts as a manipulation. Yeah. It's really hard to get permits to do this, but totally not impossible. And I think if we can show, particularly with like some earlier correlational study of like, oh, when they sing, they're less stressed or, you know, whatever, their heart rate does this or, you know, something like any of these ideas that, that, that you know, Marianne might be having about the, physiolo the physiology in response to whatever event. And then you could say, oh, look, we found these relationships now we can try, now let's try a manipulative experiment where yes, maybe we can put a tag, one of these tags on and then you can actually play the songs of a con specific, which yeah. depending, actually, right? If you could play a singing well and depending on the recipient, that could be something that's like exciting or like causes you to become angry. If you're like another, if it's a male and you're playing a song about from another male that could, you know, it could like, <laughs> so, but the point is, yeah, I think you could actually do a manipulation in that respect. And that would be really powerful and really cool to do. Yeah. I would do a completely unfamiliar sound. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. It's very cool to just like play in another animal sound. But that so, would be familiar. That, in another scenario where you just like play complete unfamiliar so sound repeatedly. I'm just thinking about very basics of learning, you know, like Pablo. You just yeah. like assign a new value to a uh right. yeah okay yeah so um a new um so we haven't connected like the physiology to that but there's been a large body of research looking at behavioral responses to sound um this was an earlier paper by my boss that is really cool and basically what it shows is that um in some cases uh when there is military sonar activity um so for some whales, it can 
cause them to flee in a really dramatic way. These are like the little, to the, the smaller tooth whales. And they can actually, and they go up and down in the water column really fast to flee that sound. And they can get the bends and die from that, uh, from, from the bends. Yeah. And so that's this acute thing that can happen that can literally kill them. Yeah. But some for these larger whales, they don't freak out to that degree. But what we've, not me, I'm actually not even involved in this, but like what the people I've worked with have shown is that even if the animals aren't, you know, freaking out to the point of death from these um, acute sort of dramatic um, noise events, in this case, military sonar tests, they, they might stop feeding. So a blue whale that might be feeding, they played these sounds to, um, and it just stopped feeding. So uh, yeah, so here's this, here's this uh, record again, here's this dive record from a blue whale. It's doing these feeding things. That, that's, the, uh, that's these little humps in the dives here. Then they played this sound um, of a, like this was a manipulative experiment. Uh -huh. They played this sound of military sonar, which wasn't actually military sonar. It was uh -huh. the experiment. And this whale, but this didn't happen in all cases, but this particular individual stopped feeding and, didn't, and did not resume feeding for like another hour and a half. Did they play um, a control sound just yes, to see if, okay, yes, cool. Yes, yeah. they played it, yes, it's called pseudo-random noise. It's basically like loud white noise. Okay. Um, yes, yes, exactly, yep. Um, yeah, but anyway, we've seen these changes in behavior. It's not universal, it doesn't always happen. Sometimes the whales change their behavior in response to these sounds. Um, sometimes they don't. Um, it doesn't seem to happen as much with random noise. It does seem to happen with this, like it might be like a conditioned, like this Pavlovian thing. For Who sure. knows? Yeah. Um, you know, but now, but but maybe even the whales that don't respond behaviorally, maybe the ones that even keep feeding through the noise, maybe their heart rate goes up, maybe their cortisol goes up, you know, who knows what, mm -hmm. right? So there's a number of different axes to think about this on, but those experiments have been done, but primarily on the, um, uh, yeah. This is so cool. I yeah. think we should wrap up, but yeah. I would yeah. love to do this again because we didn't even talk about climate change and changes in migration patterns and all these like amazing. Uh, yeah, you have to yeah. Have the, man, I would love to come back. I love doing this. We're here for two and a half hours, and I'm you know, yeah. Could this, do this is all day. yeah. I feel like this is the longest one we've done. This has been fun. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I'll be back. I, if, if I, I um, I wish I heard more about shrimps, but whatever. Oh, are you a big shrimp fan, Eisner? Yeah, I love them. <laughs> <laughs> we could talk about shrimp. But yeah. Shrimp cognition. Yeah. Cool. cool. What was that, Zach? That's for another time. Okay. Yeah. Zach already put on his pajamas. <laughs> <laughs> what time is it over there? It's got to be like, what, like 2 a.m.? No, no, it's, it's 11 20. Oh. Okay. Well, sorry, I, I, I would probably be asleep if it was 11.20 here, so. Uh, no, so we, we usually sorry. go to bed around this time. It was enjoyable. Yeah. Okay. Well, I hope it wasn't too boring, but if it was, no. then hopefully that helps lull you to sleep. <laughs> I thought no. it was fascinating. No, I think this is certainly the mopey dick of podcasts. <laughs> mm. 